Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome back to part two of Introduction and Conflicts of Interest. Yeah, welcome back. Uh, welcome back to our first uh, in our series of virtual-only broadcasts. Actually, uh, this would be the second one. Well, this is the second uh, part of the first one, or the second one of the first part, or uh, whichever you prefer. That's right. In any case, we hope you had a nice break, uh, and you're back and ready to learn about the final elements of 18 U.S.C. Section 208. And for those of, you, those, of, uh, those of you who are joining us for the first time, just catching the second half of this presentation, I'm Ryan Segrist. And I'm Patrick Shepard. So... Should we jump right into it? I, th I think we should, Ryan. Uh, so what are we going to be talking about uh, for the last segment of this, uh, of this particular presentation? So what we're going to be doing is we're going to be covering the remaining uh, key elements of 18 U.S.C. Section 208. Uh, specifically, we're going to be talking about direct and predictable effect, and we're also going to be talking about personal and substantial participation. Okay, excellent. So we have uh, two more elements, and then I think we should have some time to talk about uh, some of the, the, the remedial, remedial options that are available to us where we find uh, actual or apparent conflicts of interest. I think that's I think that's a good thing because uh, you know it's it's all fine and good for us to tell you you know how to know if there's a conflict of interest, but if we can't tell you how to fix it, then uh, what's the point? What's the point? Um, so yes, yeah, so this this should be a, a good presentation here, and um, we will probably run a little less than the full hour. Uh, if you again, if you missed the first part, uh, you can go back and watch that at your leisure. And this one will be available on the OGE YouTube page, on the homepage there, under the National Government Ethics Summit uh, playlist, so that you can go back and watch any time. You can watch it at your leisure. Yeah, and we'd also like to remind you that throughout this week and next week, we're going to be meeting at 11 and 1 to provide you presentations on days that we're not streaming from the forum or uh, speaking at the invitational days. Right. Uh, so welcome back, and let's get into the slide deck. Okay, here we go. So the next one that we're going to talk about, the next key element of 18 U.S.C. Section 208 is direct and predictable effect. Uh, what does that mean, Ryan? Well, actually, there was something I wanted to bring up even before that. Okay. So uh, for those of you who have been following along uh, and reading in your compilation of federal ethics laws, uh, yes. do you see direct and predictable effect in there? Let me have a look, Ryan. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pull up my compilation right now and uh, get over to page 19 and uh, have a quick look. I'm afraid, Ron, I'm going to have to accuse you of making things up, uh, because the, the words direct and predictable do not appear in the statute itself. You're Con absolutely right. They Con don't appear in the statute. Congress didn't say anything at all about direct and predictable. They just said where I have a financial interest. Uh huh. So where, do, where does this come from? Well, so this comes from uh, actually a Department of Justice uh, interpretation of 208. Uh, the reason why we include this as a key element when we're talking about 208 is because if uh, you don't have a direct and predictable effect on a financial interest, then it kind of doesn't make quite as much sense. You don't really have a financial interest unless there's a direct and predictable relationship between the holding and the particular matter. Right. Is that it about it? Yeah, it doesn't logically cohere then. I think we had a throwback Thursday question about direct and predictable some time ago. Oh, we did actually. Yeah, we found the earliest note and it was, it was indeed. Uh, there was one that uh, a viewer uh, alerted us to in a DOJ regulation predating the standards by some years. And also that, that, uh, that Kennedy executive order uh, memo, I think, was also the interesting one. That's right. That was, that, that was the first time that we found it okay, uh, well, appearing I, in the literature. I, I suppose I'm mollified. OGE isn't just making up things to add to the statutory language. Oh, they, certainly not. This is, in fact, a concept that uh, inheres in the statute itself, right, well, even if it's not uh, plainly spoken. It's not the subject of our fevered imaginations. All right. Well, that's good. That's good. So what is a direct and predictable effect? I don't know. That, that's a good question, Ryan. Um, so I guess what we're looking at is, is, is a real possibility. So we don't want speculation. We need things to be both direct and predictable, much like we talked about um, discrete and identifiable. So this is kind of a prong with two prongs. Right. Um, so presumably, when we say direct, we mean um, direct that uh, that uh, the, the relationship between the particular matter and the financial gain or loss is clear. It's, it's not overly attenuated. Right. You know, there, there doesn't have to be lots of extra if this happens, if that then happens, if this happens. So we don't want a lot of contingencies. Right. So say we were going to, um, we're going to contract for a new motor vehicle. Mm -hmm. uh, let's say a standard uh, consumer car. Let's say, uh, Chrysler minivan. Okay. I don't know if we still make Chrysler minivans, but say we do. Okay. So the government's going to buy a minivan for ferrying people back and forth to the airport and goods and services, things like that. Um, so the purchase of that minivan would certainly affect Chrysler, mm -hmm. if they still exist. 
Um, it they would, do. They do. Yes. Excellent. Yep. I, it would affect the dealer of uh, the, that we purchased the car from, or the contractor, or whoever. Um, what about oil prices? I, I don't think we'd have a direct and predictable effect between the value of light, sweet, crude, and the particular matter of purchasing the minivan. Right. You know, presumably we're going to drive the car, and you know, we'll use some petrol in it. So what you're suggesting is that the the employee who who may take government action on this, on let's matter, say that yeah. they have like a stock interest in uh, Exxon. Okay, Exxon or the, yes, or the United States Oil Fund or something like that. Right, and so the, uh, the so it sounds to me the question that you're asking is if this employee goes and purchases on behalf of the government this Chrysler minivan, does that whether, have a direct and predictable effect on the oil company? Right. And I think the answer is no, right? There are too many contingencies there because we have to right. buy it and then decide to drive it and then that has to do something to gas prices and that's too attenuated. There are too many causal steps. Right. And and, and I would say, let's let's say that there, there's a choice here okay. between buying a completely electric okay. Chrysler minivan yes. and a regular uh, a regular engine. Uh, uh, a carbon, combustion engine. Yes, combustion engine yes. minivan. Do you okay. think, what, what about that? Because that's... Would that have a direct and predictable effect on Exxon or the U.S. oil fund? If we're only talking about one car, I think there's no way. Yeah. Uh, maybe if we were talking about changing the entire fleet of U.S. government cars to all electric, maybe then you get to somewhere that looks a little more direct and a little more predictable. Uh, so is, is that kind of where we're going with this element? That is where we're going. Okay. That is where we're going. Because in the first example, we're, uh, you know, before I threw the prong in there between electric and internal combustion, yes. uh, we were talking about, you know, potentially hundreds of different steps, that would have things to that would have had to happen. So For us to change the spot price of uh, right. sweet crude in exactly. Texas or elsewhere. Okay, so that's kind of what we're getting at. So we want to have a direct link. And so we're talking about, you know, with specific party matters probably... We're going to have a direct link between parties. We might have a direct link between the government matter and competitors to those parties, depending mm -hmm. on the size of the industry. Right. Uh, we might have a direct enough link between uh, the parties and any subcontractors or subunits of, of those parties. Uh, so that's is that sort of where we are. That is that is where we are, and and particularly with contracts. I mean that that, that is a a little bit easier example in terms of determining the the predictability okay. of something that might happen. If you're if if we're working uh, with a contractor in an industry that there are only three contractors, right? Uh, then uh, you know the pos the real possibility that there's a direct and predictable effect. Uh, based on government action is much higher right. in there. And I, I think this is, a, is an element that we have to be very careful with, because I think as an academic exercise, it's interesting to think about direct and predictable. It's interesting to think about where we have a sufficiently close relationship between the financial holding and the particular matter. But in reality, when we're advising employees, this is an element that I don't like to stand on in order to allow an employee to go forward and participate. Why is that, Patrick? I think this element is much more useful uh, and much more likely to be uh, of import on the enforcement side. So after we've had an allegation of wrongdoing, after uh, we've decided that there's been an investigation, there's been some fact gathering, then we may find that someone didn't violate because there wasn't a direct and predictable effect. But I think, as a general matter, you should be very careful about deciding that employees should go ahead and participate because you don't think there's a direct and predictable effect. I, I, I actually I agree with you, and, and for our listeners, you may have noticed that as, as we started discussing this, we, be, we became a little bit hesitant uh, with, with our examples as to whether something may or may not have a direct and predictable effect. And that's because uh, of, uh, well, while some of our key elements, like employee, is definitely a yes, yes or, or no, no question, question. Uh, direct and predictable effect can Every single person can have a different idea of whether or not there is a direct and predictable effect. It's, there's a, mount, a certain subjectivity to it. it it's, it's, it's spectral. Right. Um, so, you know, it's not, it's not clear exactly where an enforcement uh, exercise would draw the bright line. Right. So, therefore, it's a dangerous place uh, to rely upon if you're going to uh, allow an employee to, to go forward and participate. It's certainly a factor you might consider if you're looking to implement another kind of remedy, like, for example, a waiver. Uh, but as a general matter, I think you just want to be careful with direct and predictable as, as an absent element that would allow an employee to go ahead and participate. That's why when we shorthand 18 U.S.C. Section 208, what we do is we talk about the nexus between the particular matter and the financial interest. Mm -hmm. And the nature of that relationship, especially prospectively, can be very difficult to suss out. 
Uh, so really, if we see the nexus, we want to look at some remedial activity or look to see if a regulatory exception applies, because that's really going to be the function of our prospective advice. Right. The idea is, uh, is the prevention of conflicts of interest. And if we reach a point where uh, it's looking like we're going to get pretty close, uh, let's start with the prevention now. Right. Actually, this is a good place to bring up another point that uh, is good to remember as an ethics official is that when you're talking about and advising an employee about potential conflicts of interest, the presence of this statute does not take away your agency's discretion to manage its affairs in a way that preserves the efficiency of the service. So if you have something and you're not sure if it would be outright prohibited by Section 208, you're not sure if it uh, creates an appearance concern under Subpart E, but it is outside of the agency's interest to have the employee participate. It's important to remember that your agency retains the management discretion to decide which employees work on which matters. That's right. No federal employee has a right to work on any particular matter. Yeah, or very few people. Well, very few people, <laughs> yes. yes. The, the, the president might, actually. Yes, <laughs> yeah. Um, but, you know, it's a general matter. Your agency retains management discretion uh, to decide that an employee should not participate in a matter or should constrain their participation for issues of the efficiency of the service or to prevent uh, criticism of the agency and its operations. So, you know, if you're struggling with direct and predictable, you can't decide, but it seems like the thing that's being proposed is not such a good idea, remember that you retain that management discretion. I think it's also interesting when we look at the definition of direct and predictable, when we look in the reg, it's kind of a restatement. It, it's hard to add criteria and um, thresholds to this concept. We say it has to be direct and predictable. What does that mean? Well, it has to be really possible, not kind of possible. Right. It has to be direct and not speculative. So we find in the definition kind of restatements and rewordings, uh, but we don't find the bright lines, which is another reason to be cautious if you're going to stand on this element. Right, because again, I mean, it's a, it's a sliding scale. Uh, different people uh, can have different ideas of what direct and predictable means, and we can provide sort of a general framework and say that it's got to be a real possibility and not speculative. Uh, but at but the same time... But that's going to be something that's going to be difficult to judge until uh, a possible violation has occurred. It's going to be an after-the-fact decision right. in most cases. Right. And so let's go ahead and, and move on to uh, our next uh, key element, which is personal and substantial. And I think people are going to be happier about this because we have some brighter lines. Oh, a lot of brighter there's lines. A, there's a much better or uh, much greater clarity when it comes to personal and substantial participation. This seems to be a theme. Mm -hmm. where we have, uh, we have an element that contains two elements that both must be satisfied for the element to apply. So just then we had direct and predictable, uh, and now we're going to talk about personal and substantial. Mm -hmm. So the participation must be both personal and substantial, and substantial uh, in order for us to satisfy this element. So what, Ryan, does personal mean? Well, I think personal means that the employee, him or herself, is directly involved. Okay. Uh, in, in whatever that government matter is. Okay. Uh, I think that that would also encompass, uh, you know, the direct and active, active supervision of any subordinates that that, that uh, federal employee has. But that means that the employee has to be actively and personally involved. So they have to be, uh, it's not just a question of being, you know, ultimately responsible, but actively involved, personally involved in the matter and the supervision. Right. So personal means personal. It means you Literally, do it, that person. You do it with your person. Right. Uh, it, it's not where you sit on an org chart. It's not just a, a chain of command issue. It's it's your active and personal p participation. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I feel pretty good about personal. So so uh, what kind of what kind of things do we, do, what would we count uh, is, uh, you know, uh, substantial then? Substantial so involvement. I think substantial is a little more complicated. Mm -hmm. But I, I like to think of it this way. I, I think of it as uh, we have substantial participation if the participation gets to the substance of the matter, right? So when we have a particular government matter, uh, we have to get to the substance of the matter. So if we're contemplating a regulation, uh, it has to get to, you know, kind of what the scope of the regulation is about or how it's worded or you know, the substance of the regulation, mm -hmm. which we could contrast with maybe merely ministerial involvement. So here, let me try and, let me try and drop an example here. Okay. So let's say that... Uh, Let's say that we've got two employees who are working on this regulation. Okay. Uh, one of them is involved primarily with the writing of the regulation. 
Okay, so we like, have we have uh, the, the, the draftsman, the person who's going to be drafting the regulation, doing right, the writing. Doing the research, uh, you know, uh, putting that into the draft of the re regulation okay. and all of that. Making the decisions about what goes where, where the thresholds are, those kinds of things. Right. And let's say that that person has uh, uh, an administrative assistant okay. who uh, will be making copies of the draft to... Uh, distribute. To, to distribute to superiors and everybody everybody else who needs to read the draft. Okay, very good. So you have the uh, the administrative assistant who is going to be helping uh, with the administrative activities that go into doing the regulations. Right, so copying, staple, stapling, that kind of thing. Maybe booking conference rooms for mm -hmm. meetings with important stakeholders, uh, maybe sending meeting invites, those kinds of things. Right, but th this person isn't actually going to be in the room making any decisions about the regulation. Okay, very good. So what do you think? Well, I think certainly the person who's drafting the regulation is going to be personally and substantially involved. Mm -hmm. The administrative support person, I think they're going to be personally involved, right? They're going to be doing things about the regulation and with respect to the particular matter personally. But I think as you've described it, those activities don't seem to be of substance to the matter. So I think on the, the second prong, we're going to fail for that person with respect to this element. I agree with you. Uh, the, and the reason why is because, the, you know, whether this person makes copies or not, right. um, the regulation is still being written by someone else. Okay, well, let me let me throw a wrinkle in here. Okay. Uh, so, so say this is a, rather than a purely administrative support person, uh, this is an assistant, uh, uh, maybe, maybe a junior employee uh, to the person who's drafting the regulation. And they'll be taking care of those same ministerial details that uh, you discussed earlier. But say additionally, they're going to be taking minutes uh, in some of those meetings with stakeholders. Um, and let's let's add another wrinkle to this. Okay. And they're going to take those minutes and type them up into a meeting summary and prioritize the, the preferences of each of those stakeholders or concerns of each of those stakeholders. Okay. So out of this meeting, they're going to record what took place and then create a list of priorities that must be addressed or at least considered during the rulemaking. Do you think that crosses the line into substance? Uh, I think it. I think it might. Okay. I think. It, I think that that's a that's a pretty close one. Uh, the. It also depends on whether or not we would look at that person's involvement in the meeting as a separate, particular matter entirely from the larger creation of the regulation. What do you think about that? Well, I think I think this person's participation will be substantial. Uh, they're exercising discretion mm -hmm. about uh, matters or ideas that need to be addressed in the rulemaking process. So I think by making setting the priorities for the consideration for the process of rule drafting, uh, they, they are they are participating in a way that is both personal and of substance to the matter. Uh, but I think this is where it's very very tricky. Um, you know, making these distinctions with employees when you're speaking prospectively can be quite challenging, and it's something you really want to make sure you do. Um, because you could say, well, you know, as long as you're just supporting in an administrative capacity, uh, you can go forward and participate. And leaving it to an employee to understand the difference between, you know, distributing notes or distributing meeting agendas or, you know, those kind of things. And um, setting priorities or creating the agenda, uh, you know, these are distinctions that are important to us as ethics officials. And they are, in fact, important to our employees, but we need them to know that. Right. And I think that, I think that from the sliding, the sort of uh, sliding example that you gave, that, that you gave to us, um, <clears throat> that I, I would agree with you that that, that person is, is uh, substantially involved in the in the sense that they're rendering advice on which uh, what which should, things what, to deal what, what with. What should come first or what should be, you know, what's most important to the process. Right. But then there's a there's a, a little bit of a, a split that we can do if the person was just recording the minutes and not doing anything with them afterwards. Right. Um, if they were just recording the minutes, even if they were just recording and distributing the minutes, they still didn't have any kind of say in what was going on. There right. was no sort of decision or approval or rendering of advice or anything like that. And so that, that kind of... It, that, that that's sounds, what we're looking for, is when we're looking for yeah. personal and substantial, it's are you exercising judgment? Are you making decisions or determinations or recommendations? And I think this is important also that merely recommending that something be done a certain way can be of substance as long as that recommendation is substantive. Right. Uh, if the recommendation is we should meet in this room rather than this room because this one's more comfortable, uh, that's not going to go to the substance. But if the recommendation is you should weigh these people's thoughts heavier than these, or you should do this first, or this is most important, we should put it at the front, uh, those kinds of recommendations can be of substance to the matter. So right. they don't have to be dispositive. This person doesn't have to have ultimate authority over the matter uh, to be personally and substantially involved. So do we have anywhere we can go that might be kind of helpful to find out what other types of uh, involvement would be considered substantial? 
Um, I believe we have it, a definition, Ryan, in the in the regulation. Do you want to take a minute to look at that? Uh, yeah, sure. Let's see if we can find the definition. Well, actually, we could go uh, somewhere somewhere even before that. Okay. Because we uh, the 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 statute, 18 U.S.C. Section 208, helpfully has a list of things that are kind of like personal. Well, things that are personal and substantial participation. Uh, that, that'll kind of give you, give you a flavor of the kinds of things that we're talking about uh, before we go look at the uh, the definition of personal and substantial in the reg. Okay. So some of those, uh, some of exa the examples directly from the statute are uh, decision, approval, disapproval, recommendation, like we were talking about, the rendering of advice, like okay. we were talking about. Absolutely. Um, investigating, uh, investigation, in the sense of investigating something. Okay. <clears throat> so those are all the. And this is not an exhaustive list. This is just kind of a, a flavor of the different kind of things. Yeah, and actually we do have the definition, and it, it, it basically restates the conversation we've just had here, mm -hmm. uh, where we find that through decision approval, disapproval, recommendation, rendering of advice, and investigation, we can participate personally and substantially. And there is an emphasis that that participation need both be personal and get to the substance of the matter. Right. Um, so it's always good to know that your definitions are available. And here we're at 2640-103. Uh, finding the definitions there. So for, for purposes of personal and substantial, we've, we've said that like administrative or ministerial <coughs> involvement and doesn't rise to the level of being substantial participation. And I think we want to emphasize that means purely administrative involvement. Right, uh, right. Not, uh, you know, if we can, uh, we can be administratively involved as well as substantively involved. Uh, at OGE, we have a, a small office, so it's very often that you wear more than one hat. Yeah. So that's something you want to be, you want to be mindful about. Are there, are there any other uh, things that don't rise to, uh, the level of substantial participation. Well, I think merely knowing that something's happening within the organization isn't sufficient to constitute personal and substantial participation. So if you know your colleagues down the hall are working on something, uh, that doesn't make you a participant in the particular matter. Uh, merely being officially responsible uh, isn't sufficient. And this is very good for our agency heads and other high-level officials because ultimately they're responsible for a whole lot of things that they never ever hear about. Right. And managing conflicts for them would be nearly impossible uh, if we had to know about every activity, every matter that every employee under that person's official responsibility uh, were involved in. Right. They, they, they could not have any sort of financial holdings at all. In some cases, that might be true. Mm -hmm. So um, we need more than official responsibility. We need more than perfunctory involvement, which is kind of what we've been talking about. Right. Uh, you know, could you take this down the hall and hand it to someone else? Uh, you know, if the involvement is, is merely ministerial or, um, you know, these kinds of things, then we're okay. Yeah, and I think ministerial kind of captures both perfunctory and administrative. Right. Uh, just walking something down the hall is, is perfunctory. Just right. creating copies for a meeting is, is administrative support. Right, and it, it's not the volume of uh, participation that gets us to personal substantial. Someone could be administratively very involved in something. They can be performing all sorts of functions. They can be organizing agendas, booking conference rooms, coordinating stakeholders. Uh, they can be making signage. They could, you know, do all sorts of things. Right. Uh, and not be personally and substantially involved. Mm -hmm. In contrast, it's not the amount; it's the kind. In contrast, you could have an employee who attends a meeting for five minutes, makes a single recommendation, uh, and is personally and substantially involved. Right. Absolutely possible. In thirty seconds, you can personally and substantially involve yourself in a particular matter, if you take the right kinds of action. If they're personal and substantial. Uh, you can be involved for weeks and months and never do anything that's of substance to the matter and never satisfy this element. Right, which is why we got to be particularly careful in our <clears throat> advice and counsel uh, when, our, when our employees come to us and, and say, you know, what, what can I do, what can't I do? Mm -hmm. uh, we have to be ready to consider all of these possibilities. And I think, you know, if you're going to rely upon this in an opinion to an employee, uh, this is an area where it's worthwhile to have a phone call or a face-to-face -face meeting with the employee to make sure that they really understand where the important lines are, uh, where the important uh, division between administrative involvement and substantive involvement lies. I also think that it, that, that, uh, it would be a good practice to, uh, if you're going to have the employee on the phone or have a face-to-face -face with the employee, to get that employee's supervisor in there too. Uh, so that the supervisor also has a sense of the kind of things that that employee can and cannot do. Yeah, and I think this is a, a, a good thing as we get into the remedies. So the people who direct work to your employees who are potentially conflicted can be great assets uh, by not assigning someone to do substantive work. So if you have someone who's ministerially involved in a matter who cannot be substantively involved, well, we can ask other parties or other participants in that matter not to direct substantive work to that employee. Right. Uh, so if we have meeting minutes, 
and they need to be prioritized in order of priority. Mm -hmm. uh, we can have someone else do that uh, because that's somewhere where, you know, not just the employee him or herself, but also the person directing the work uh, could inadvertently cause a conflict. Right. So those are all of our, all of our key elements. Uh, we talk about some remedies? Let us talk about some re <coughs> remedies, Ryan. Okay. So we've got kind of a menu of possibilities for remedies. Uh, we've got recusal reassignment, uh, divestiture, resignation, and waivers. Well, tell me, Ryan, when do we need a remedy? What, what, are, what are these remedies to? What are they doing for us? So the remedies, what they're doing is preventing participation in a matter in which, the, in a particular matter in which the employee has a financial interest. Okay. So if we have a potential 208 violation. Right. And we decide that an employee could not participate in this particular matter. Right. We need to do something to keep them from violating 208. Right. So what we're going to do is we're going to take away one or more of the elements mm -hmm. in most cases uh, to prevent the, the criminal conflict of interest. Right, because remember that all, all of the elements have to have to be met in order for 208 to apply. And if we can take away one or more of the elements, uh, then 208 does not apply. Okay, excellent. So we have this first one, recusal and reassignment. Uh, and this strikes me as the easiest because we said before that Section 208 is a bar on participation. Mm -hmm. So what we do here is we just say you will not participate. Right, or the employee can also say I cannot participate because... Because of this potential conflict. In right. fact, the employee has an obligation to do so. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the duty to comply with 18 U.S.C. Section 208 lies with the employee. Right. As ethics officials, it's our job to help them. Okay, so recusal would mean simply not participating. Right. Um, that seems like an easy one. Why don't we just use recusal all the time? We said the, the statute requires it. Mm -hmm. um, it certainly is effective. It, it, it satisfies the requirements of Section 2. It prevents violations. Um, is there any reason that we would want to ever go beyond recusal? Well, th there actually are, are some reasons. Let's, uh, from, a, from a purely management perspective, let's say that we have an employee who uh, is having to recuse so often that their ability to do the job is materially impaired. So recusing yourself out of a job, so to speak. All right, so this is uh, like if we had an employee who was uh, invested in a lot of technology companies, mm -hmm. uh, you know, co computer companies, software companies, lots of technology companies. And that employee was assigned as the head of procurement in our CIO's office. And they say, couldn't participate in any matters. They're assigned matters. They say, I'm sorry, I have these holdings. Uh, 18 U.S.C. Section 208 prohibits me from participating. I'm afraid I can't do it. Is that kind of what you're getting at? That would be... That, that is. And that's the, uh, one thing that I would add to that is, uh, we, let, let's say for purposes of that example, that we don't have the ability to assign that employee to a totally different set of duties. Okay, so if they were just a procurement official, which are procuring office supplies instead of IT equipment, right. and then we're good to go. So that would be an, an example of reassignment. Mm -hmm. But say we, we couldn't do this. This person was hired because of their technology expertise, and we need them to participate in these procurements. Right. So for the efficiency of the service and to help the employee carry out the job they've been hired and are paid to do, we're going to I have to. Right. And, and what, what, what is the, the offending thing in, in this example? It's the presence of all of the, the technology stocks. The financial holdings right. are creating financial interests in all of these contracts, these particular matters. Right. And because of that, our employee can't participate. So we should take away a different element. That's right. And, and if we can take away the financial interest in a particular matter, then the 208 goes away. Okay, so we're going to take a, away the financial interest, and we're going to do this by having them sell their financial holdings in the technology sector. Right. So generally speaking, we ask them to sell. Okay. Uh, but we do have the authority, uh, if, the, if, the con if the potential conflict is going to be uh, materially impair their ability to do their job, we can require... Uh, a divestiture. And this is one of those areas where uh, you know, it's not common that I think it's a good idea to start with subpart D of the standards when mm -hmm. you're looking for interpretive guidance uh, with respect to 18 U.S.C. section 208. However, um, there is something very interesting in there, and this is where we find the explicit regulatory authority to direct divestiture. Right. And we find that in subpart D of the standards of conduct, and we find that in 403. And 2635403 says an employee shall not acquire or hold any financial interest that he is prohibited from acquiring or holding by statute. So if we have one of those other um, kinds of agency organic statute or, or supplemental, supplemental regulation. Right. Okay, we can't hold those. Uh, 
apply. If we have agency regulations, we can't violate those. Um, so you know, that's, that's good to know. But we also get the authority to direct divestiture in those cases where an employee's recusal affects their ability to complete the, the work of the agency. It, it affects the efficiency of the service. And we as ethics officials can make a determined juncture. So that's good to know. Yeah, that is good to know. And when your employees ask you, well, who says you can tell me? Well, you can look at subpart D of the standards and uh, you will see it there. Right. All right, so I, I'm pretty comfortable with that. Yeah, and, and one thing to remember is that a divestiture totally, there's no residual kind of uh, problem that we have to worry about, uh, like you will find tomorrow with impartiality. So uh, divestiture takes care of the, the problem immediately, as soon as the thing is sold. Right. And I'd also like to point out that these remedies are in addition to the regulatory exemptions that OG has promulgated in 5 CFR 2640. So y you want to start with 2640 if you have a potential conflict to make sure you don't have a regulatory exemption. And we conducted uh, a couple of months ago in the Advanced Practitioner Series an overview of these exemptions. So if you didn't catch that, you can go back and watch that on the YouTube channel or the Google Plus page uh, and learn more about the, uh, the, uh, the regulatory exemptions. Uh, so those are available in addition to these remedies. And one other thing to remember for employees that are agree to divest or directed to divest, uh, in order to uh, remove a potential conflict of interest is that these folks have the ability to apply for a certificate of divestiture and I don't want to take I don't want to spend very much time uh, talking about that uh, I think we're going to try and get uh, a certificate of divestiture uh, course together sometime within the next year have one of our, our experts on the nominee team deliver that but it's important just to know that these exist a certificate of divestiture is uh, a mechanism that allows employees to defer capital gains and the thing to know about these is that you have to get one from OGE, and the employee has to get it before they execute the divestiture, before they sell the offending asset. Right. If they sell it first, they will not get a CD. So if you have an employee who's being directed to divest or must divest to comply with the conflict of interest rules, talk to OGE, and we can help you through that process and make sure that your employee receives the certificate of divestiture before they sell the stock so that they can defer the capital gain. And one other thing to remember, and the only reason why I mention this is because it has happened, uh, if your employee agrees to divest, they still can't participate until the divestiture has actually occurred. Yeah, so that's very important to know. But verify on that one. Yeah, you want to make sure uh, before you allow an employee to go ahead and participate that any remedial action has taken place already, right. not just that you've planned to have it take place. Right. All right, so that's divestiture, fi uh, a financial interest or not a financial interest, a financial holding uh, that creates a disqualifying financial interest can be divested in order to comply with 208. Mm -hmm. But we have financial interests that can arise from things other than financial holdings, such as outside positions. We said the financial interests of persons uh, with whom an employee is an employee or serves as officer, director, or trustee serves as a general partner or has an arrangement concerning future employment, mm -hmm. those interests are also imputed to the employees. So when we have a conflict that arises from one of these financial interests, I guess we have to consider something else. That's right. And what we have to consider there is there is a, a resignation. Uh, if, that's, if that outside position is going to be creating a potential conflict uh, and we're not, a, and our employee is not able to recuse uh, from it or is having to recuse too often, then we can ask them to resign from that outside position. That's right. Uh, so you know, that's an important thing to know. So just like uh, divestiture with respect to financial holdings, we have a similar authority and it's sometimes appropriate to ask an employee to resign from outside positions. Of course, resignation b works both ways. Uh, sometimes you might have an employee who says, I refuse to resign from my outside position. Well, another way to fix that is to stop participating in, in all government matters by virtue of ending your federal employment. That is true. All right, so that feels pretty good. I think we're uh, in pretty good shape with respect to recusals, divestitures, resignations. But sometimes you have an intractable problem. Uh, maybe you have a financial holding that can't uh, easily be divested. There's maybe not a market for it. Um, maybe you have uh, an arrangement where you have an imputed financial interest that the employee can't you know, efficiently get rid of or it's not within the employee's discretion to get rid of. Um, then we have some other tools, don't we? Uh, yeah, we do have a we do have a couple. Um, one of the well, the one that uh, we have here on the slide is uh, a waiver. We have we have two flavors of waiver, for rhyming. Uh, we have a waiver provision under 18 U.S.C. Section 208 B1, and B1 waivers allow us to determine that a financial holding of an employee 
um, creates a financial interest that is not so significant as to affect the efficiency of their service to the government. So basically we determine that, yeah, technically this is a conflict of interest. But given all of the circumstances, we don't think that the financial interest is so great as to affect the uh, the efficiency or quality of the service the employee is going to provide. So we're saying that the person can participate in those matters after they've received a waiver despite the the literal conflict of interest that exists. Yeah, and I think we're, we're going to have uh, we've a number of opinions out on this, and I think we're going to have some new guidance in uh, the very near future. And you know, that should be very helpful when you when you need to, or if you think you need to uh, implement a B1 waiver. Now, one thing that I, well, actually, before we do uh, before we do the uh, the availability of waivers. Yes. Uh, what was the other kind of waiver? Uh, the, the other kind of waiver is the 18 U.S.C. Section 208 B3 waiver, and this applies specifically to your special government employees serving on federal advisory committees created by the Federal Advisory Committee Act. That sounds very specific. That's quite specific. So if you have FACA committees and you have special government employees serving on those FACA committees, they may be el eligible in certain circumstances for a B3 waiver. And uh, this is a waiver that uh, determines that there is a conflict, but the need for the employee service outweighs the conflict. Right. Um, so some agencies have lots of FACA committees, issue lots of B3 waivers. Uh, other agencies don't have any committees and never think about 208B3. Uh, you probably know which category you're in. Uh, and we should also maybe think about doing a course on, on B3 waivers at some time in the future. I think that's a good idea, Patrick. Yeah. Now, one thing, particularly with the B1 waivers, uh, this is not so much the case with B3 waivers because that's such a specific case. But with B1 waivers, uh, you have to remember that you need to consult with OGE on the issuance of any of those waivers. And we view those as uh, a remedy of absolute last resort because you're waiving a criminal provision uh, when you issue a waiver. So if you think that a waiver is the most appropriate thing, you need to call your desk officer. Uh, and I'll tell you right now that they're gonna try and find some other kind of uh, remedy. If divestiture is still a possible remedy, then you're not gonna, uh, the, the waiver uh, we're we're going to talk through the possibilities right. before. Uh, this is not without purpose. Uh, these are uh, items that are of interest to the public and other, other key stakeholders outside of the government. Uh, they frequently and seems perennially receive press attention. So it's not that we should never issue waivers. It's that we should be very careful and very prudent when considering them as the remedy uh, the, the preferred remedy in a given situation. That's right. Uh, but please contact us because we'd be happy to help you through that and uh, we look forward to maybe producing some more guidance on that in the future. Also look for some very near-term guidance from OGE on waiver drafting. All right, well, I think uh, you know, that's, a, that's a pretty good set of things that we have here, Ryan. Uh, so we've talked through the possible remedies. We've talked through the elements of Section 208. Um, Let's talk really briefly about just your, your conflicts analysis in general as sort of a, a lead into what we're going to talk about tomorrow. Okay, that sounds good. Um, so with the conflicts analysis, the first place we want to start, and particularly when we're looking at financial disclosure reports, but any time we're considering a potential conflict, consider Section 208 first. That's the first place to start. Make sure you don't have a potential criminal conflict of interest. If you have one, take the steps necessary to remedy it. And if, if you find one that's already happened, you have a duty to report it to your Inspector General in the Department of Justice Public Integrity section. Yeah, so make sure that you have taken care of any potential criminal conflict of interest problems first. And then once you've satisfied yourself that those are managed or taken care of or they don't exist, right. then and only then move on to the impartiality considerations that we're going to discuss tomorrow. So tomorrow Cheryl's going to join us at 11 Eastern Daylight Time and start talking about subparty of the standards, the various elements and uh, uh, concepts that you need to understand to apply that provision, uh, but don't consider that one first. Yes, don't go to don't go to 502 first. Go to 208 first. Yeah. So the look at your compilation, look at your criminal laws first, and and then consider the regulatory provisions. Um, so we're looking forward very much to hearing from Cheryl tomorrow about those regulatory provisions. Uh, we hope you will join us for those, um, and we hope you found this to be a useful presentation and make yourself uh, make use of the other conflicts of interest. Um, courses that we have available on the YouTube and Google Plus pages. That's right. And we have just a couple uh, a couple more uh, administrative announcements uh, that we want to we want to get out before we close for the day. So the first one is uh, we want to remind all of you who are participating virtually to uh, follow OGE on Twitter. 
Uh, the handle is at Office Gov Ethics. You can also share with your, your thoughts on the National Government Ethics Summit using the summit hashtag, which is uh, Octothorpe Ethics Summit or Pound Sign Ethics Summit or hashtag Ethics Summit, however you prefer to say it. That's right. So, uh, and, and we encourage you to share with us your, ver your, your experience. How are you engaging with the content virtually? Like, for example, if uh, let's say that you've got a bunch of people together uh, to sit in a conference room and, and watch some of the sessions that we're live streaming or some of the virtual only sessions, tweet us a picture of that because we'd love to share those pictures so that everybody can see them. Yeah, because we really want the folks who are attending virtually and you are very numerous. Uh, we've had, I think, over a thousand people stop by the virtual summit so far. We want to share your experience with uh, other virtual attendees and also share your experiences with the people who are uh, you know, actually at the facilities in DC attending the actual summit. So I think they'd be excited to know that their colleagues are benefiting uh, from this shared ethics education experience. Right, and one last reminder is that tomorrow, again at 11, 11 Eastern Daylight Time, we're going to be doing, uh, joined by our, our colleague Cheryl, and we're going to be talking about impartiality, and we hope to see you there. Okay, so uh, we will see you tomorrow. We hope you join us for the rest of the National Government Ethics Virtual Summit. I'm Patrick Shepard. And I'm Ryan Segrist, and we'll see you tomorrow. Bye-bye.